I started motorcycling basically when I was 17. Uh, worked my way up to larger bikes, started being a motorbike instructor then. So driving school sort of thing, teaching people to pass. And I think when I was about 34, we got uh, clipped by a car that decided it would take us as we turned into a petrol station. They hit us about 70 miles an hour. Uh, so I get my confidence back, I started riding uh, push bikes. So then in 2001, as you just said, that was when you actually had your first accident. Yeah. And you were hit from a car from behind doing 60 miles an hour. It left me with a shattered uh, right ankle, lower leg. And not knowing at the time, I also had a damaged back. And after I came out to plaster, I started racing again. So I was turning up on crutches, doing some races. My back was still hurting, so I went back to hospital and it was discovered that I had a fractured vertebrae, which was triangular shape, and the, the triangle part point was actually pointing towards the spinal cord. So they thought that any hard bumps I would have hit on the road while racing could have severed the spinal cord. But this was an accident that pretty much turned your life upside down. How did you sort of cope with that initially? I just found that I think because I'd gone also from able-bodied to disabled, and found a niche where I could actually ride, I think it became easier to cope with. I don't know if it's totally easy to cope with, but it became easier. So the speed was sort of a way for you to get over what you'd gone through? Yeah, I think it was the speed. is also knowing that, to start with, I didn't have to go on the road. I was basically track and turbo. So I was able to get my confidence back up by doing the track work because uh, I was down the track three times a week down Newport. Then, after, maybe after about six months, I started back on the road properly. But I think because I had already had my confidence, it was a lot easier. And then you had an incredible year in 2008 when you went to the Beijing Olympics. Yeah. You won two golds, a silver, and you broke the world record in the kilo. Yeah. How did it feel to represent your country? It was um, it's very strange to represent because... Even though I'm there as GP, I, I've always classed myself as Welsh, so it's, it's, it's difficult finding that, um, finding your place within the GP team. It must have changed your life quite a lot, all of a sudden going from a normal guy to a Paralympic champion. It's, it's changed it on the short term. But when we came back, it was press interview after press interview, people recognising you walking around town, you're signing things all the time. Um, even up to a state of now, when we're moving house, and the people in the village already know who I am. So then you were also awarded in this amazing year an MBE. Yeah. That must have been incredible. The MBE I am more proud of, because the gold medals, world records, were recognition for job well done when the MBE we knew nothing about at all. It's just a great honour to be awarded that for something, it, for sport, for disabled sport rather than just for British cycling. So then after a really phenomenal three years, a few years, you had um, another incredibly traumatic accident. Yeah, I was out training ready for London 2012. Um, at the time, I was probably in my category the fastest person on the road in the country. So I had a good chance of going, but I still had to qualify. So I was going up a hill, probably about seven miles from the house, and a drunk driver drove straight through me, left me with lacerations to my left leg, pierced bowel, uh, broken back in multiple places, broken sternum in three places, collapsed lung, blood clots on the lung, uh, and whiplash brain injuries as well. I was in a juice coma for 15 days. After such an incredible sort of few years, how did you then <coughs> begin to even process what had just happened to you? It's taken a long time. I, I've been through, been with some good psychiatrists because I've, I've had very bad depression. I'm still on antidepressants now because of my depression. Um, it's hard because people don't realise what you go through in a coma you go through what they call uh, delirium. So you have um, like surreal dreams. So in my case, it was like um, playing the Sims game. So you're behind glass walls and somebody else is controlling you sort of thing. But it's deja vu 
every day is exactly the same, repeated over and over again. But they brought me out of my coma three times. Each time I went back under, I went back under, under a different delirium state. So my first delirium state, I was quite a happy childhood memory sort of thing. The second one then, I had doctors try to kill me. And then in the third delirium state, I went back in, I had the light on, um, going towards the light sort of thing. And I had to keep the light turned on to stay alive. If it turned the light off, I would have died. It, it's just hard to come around and realise that I was dead for 15 days and just trying to get that into your head and trying to, once you've got, you try to process it, to try and understand everything and trying to get back to a state where you can live a normal life. Because it's not only, it's not only the physical injuries you've sustained, it's also giving you psychological injuries in those kinds yeah. of ways. Uh, physical injuries, I would say, I'm coping with. Mentally, I, I struggle. I, I do struggle daily with it. Um, up until probably about two months ago, I was still having nightmares. Um, not so much anymore, but I get, strangely, I get very real dreams. But yeah, mentally, I am taking a lot of medication to try and keep the depression away. More than anything else. And not only for you, but this must also have been incredibly difficult for your family. While yeah. You're in. I know Amanda, every time she went home for the first 15 days, was told that I might be dead the next day. Um, so that, that was hard. She, she was always told, expect a phone call, which is uh, a difficult one to drive home from. But they're, they're coping. Uh, I wouldn't say they're coping great, but uh, she, she won't let into it. Have you found it difficult to sort of adapt to the massive change in lifestyle that's occurred since? Um, I have. At the time of the accident, I, when I was in hospital, I lost three stone in body weight. So I, I came home, I couldn't even lift up an empty uh, drinks bottle off the floor. So it's taken a lot to get the strength back, be able to use a wheelchair myself, to be able to self-transfer, to even to get onto the toilet myself. Now, at least now I can do it, but at the time, I, I couldn't, so it's taken me... Uh, so it's two, just over two years to get to a state where I can actually do stuff myself. So, yeah, it, it's been a difficult transfer, definitely. Do you sort of hold any resentment at all towards the driver that hit you? Nothing at all. All I want to know is why he drove off. Uh, I know he didn't deliberately come out to knock somebody off a, off a bike or knock somebody over. Yes, he was drunk. So if he hadn't been drunk, yes, it wouldn't have happened. But as I say, he didn't deliberately come to do it. So I don't hold any resentment against him. I just would like to know why he drove off. Now, something that must have been sort of even more painful alongside your accident was the fact you were training for the London 2012 Olympics. Yeah, I carried well, I, I carried a torch in Cardiff and lit the cauldron, which was the, one of the cauldrons that had to be lit to light the one in London. And I carried the torch around uh, Canary Wharf as well. I went from there to, I think that was on the Wednesday, on the Friday then I was back up at the velodrome watching uh, some of my teammates race and it was quite emotional. Now although doctors did say you're unable to ride sort of a conventional bike, yeah. you're now adventuring into different methods of cycling. Could yeah, you... I'm now riding uh, Ice Trike which is a three wheel of um, which means I can actually still power my legs. I'm lying down and supporting my back because on a normal solo bike I can't reach the bars properly to be in a aerodynamic position but with this it gives me the opportunity to, opportunity to actually race. Do you think having that ability to potentially compete at some point is helping you recover? It's helping me recover but I'm finding it a very slow recovery this time because what I'm finding more difficult is I don't want to go on the road. I'm, f I'm finding that a very nervous part of it to get the my head around, to get get back out there, get the confidence to be on the road and not to be scared, because I, I am scared to be out there. You seem to be completely bitten by the cycling bug and the speed bug. Can you ever imagine anything stopping you from riding altogether? Nothing will stop the speed bug 
but whether I actually have to stop writing is another thing. We don't know how my back's going to recover. I've got two more collapsed discs, and they're going to operate on that again in the, in the future. So I will still be doing speed work, but I don't know how I'm going to be doing speed work. It'll either be somehow back on motorbikes, somehow on push bikes, or it'll be uh, somehow in racing car. I don't know. It'll have to be something.